Bienvenidos a una nueva transmisión de la Fundación para el Progreso en otra conversación con un personaje de categoría mundial, un académico muy connotado de Estados Unidos, un eh, gran defensor de las ideas de la libertad, un prolífico autor, profesor de la Universidad de Georgetown, eh, muy conocido, famoso y también con tesis eh, muy eh, provocadoras, discutidas eh, y necesarias para estimular el pensamiento crítico. Nos acompaña eh, Jason Brennan. Thank you for being here with us uh, at FPP these days. It has been uh, exhausting for you, I guess, uh, but we are very happy to have you here. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and it has been invigorating, not exhausting. I'm happy to hear that, so we will invite you very soon again. Yes. Come visit us. Um, we translated your book, um, Why Not Capitalism, into Spanish. Um, where you respond to very famous uh, Marxist thinker um, from Oxford, Gerard Cohen, who wrote a book in turn called Why Not Socialism? Um, and as you will explain, he says, well, maybe socialism doesn't work that well, capitalism produces better results, but morally socialism is um, superior than capitalism. You say no. Not even on moral grounds is socialism better than capitalism. And it would be very important for us and our audience, people who will watch this conversation later, for you to explain this. Why do you say that not even uh, on, based on moral grounds, it's um, socialism not superior than capitalism, but the other way around? Yeah, very good. Uh, I think to explain why, I have to sort of explain Cohen's argument first. Right. And so what Cohen does is try to argue, sure, in the real world with people like you and me, flawed, morally imperfect individuals, and all those other people out there who, frankly, are worse than we are, um, socialism works be doesn't work very well because people aren't very nice. They're not very kind. If they're asked to share, they take advantage of one another and they don't do their part. If you give them the power to run a government for the sake of the common good, they in fact run it for their own interest and destroy their enemies. He says that's what happens under socialism, but that doesn't mean socialism is inherently bad. The problem is human beings are bad. We're just not very good. So he wants to argue that deep down we're all socialists in our heart. If I, if I, Gerald Cohen, could wave my magic wand and transform every human being into a saint, we'd be able to make socialism work. So to illustrate that, he has this thought experiment involving a camping trip where we live together by socialist principles, and it sounds absolutely wonderful. And then he says, I want you to compare this wonderful utopian camping trip to the kinds of behaviors you see in real life capitalism, where people often fail to help one another, where they buy fancy consumption and status goods they don't need, where they interact with each other, but only for the sake of profit, not out of just genuine concern. Which seems better? And almost everyone who reads this book says, your camping trip, your socialist camping trip, sounds better than a description of some of the bad behaviors in real life capitalism. So he says, aha, you're really all just socialists. And socialism has the moral high ground. It doesn't work, but it has the moral high ground. Most people read that and go, I ah, got me. I guess he's right. And even certain classical liberal thinkers like David Hume and sometimes even Adam Smith seem like they agree with that. Like it would be better if we were good, but it, we're not. So it, we have to be capitalist instead. But I think there's a mistake here because what Cohen has done effectively is ask you to imagine socialism plus angels and compare that to capitalism plus normal people. And socialism plus angels is better than capitalism plus normal right. people. But what's doing the work? Is it the change of the kind of economic system? Or is it the fact that we have angels over here and normal people over here? If I give you a similar argument where I said, I want you to compare, um, the, like, would you rather live under Queen Elsa from Frozen, Disney's mm -hmm. Frozen, after she gets her magic powers fixed, or Donald Trump, the current US president, you might pick Elsa. That doesn't mean that you prefer monarchy to uh, democracy. It might just be you think monarchy plus a really good queen is better than democracy plus a buffoon. So you know, um, you're not comparing right, apples right, right. to apples, as we say. So what we need to do then is articulate a moral ideal of capitalism and describe what would capitalism look like if it had perfect people, and would that be preferable, equal to, or worse than socialism with perfect people? We have to do, to answer this theory, we have to do utopian theorizing. Right. And so um, the way to see what utopian capitalism looks like is to turn on your television and watch a TV show that Disney put out called The Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, which I think you have here. 
Uh, in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, all these other characters live together in an anarchist society. They have no need for government, no need for violence to enforce their cooperation. They always do things to help one another. They work together cooperatively. They respect each other. They respect their rights. They, they take pride in one another's differences and celebrate their differences. They have some things that they have in common, but they also have a robust free market capitalist society where they own factories and farms and things like that, and they sell them and they trade back and forth. And there's nothing in this society that a socialist could complain about. It shows what capitalism would look like if it were perfect, if human beings were perfect. And there's lots of reasons why we could go through like why even if people are morally flawless, you might want things like private property and markets. But the main thing I ask at the end of the book is, if you, the reader, had to choose between utopian capitalism as described by the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse or utopian socialism as described by Jerry Cohen, which would you choose? And overwhelmingly, I've asked thousands and thousands of people this over the years, overwhelmingly, everyone, almost everyone chooses the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, including avowed socialists. Can you uh, elaborate on the reason why you would prefer capitalism in this, uh, in this uh, ideal world, ideal socialism versus ideal capitalism? Why do you think people say, I would prefer ideal capitalism over ideal socialism? It's because of uh, they feel there is more freedom in, in, in this uh, alternative uh, utopia? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I think they think um, under an ideal kind of capitalist society, you can live your life many different ways and you have many different options. Under a sort of utopian socialist society, it's, everything is all one way. Um, and what I mean by that is, like when I sat down to write this book, I didn't write it in a committee with the whole philosophy profession at once. We didn't do it collectively. I had an idea for a book to write. I had to test that, like whether it was a good idea on my own. I wrote it myself. I had to submit it to a publisher. I had to have anonymous people decide whether they thought it was worth publishing. And if people buy it, they're making that decision for themselves. They're buying it be not because they like me and want to be my friend, but because they think it's worth having for their own sake. And that's a kind of affirmation of my efforts and the value of what I've done when people do it. If I had to sit down and every time I wrote a philosophy paper or a philosophy book, I had to do it in committee as a collective, collective creation, it would be stifling. It would be exhausting. I wouldn't have any real freedom myself. I mean, imagine you and I right. and, and the rest of the world are writing a book together. We'd have to first vote, what is it going to be about? Oh, puppies again. Right. Great. Okay, what's the first word? We vote. Oh, the. It, it'd be horrible. And people, most socialists recognize that in order for us to leave authentic lives, we need to have private spheres that are our own. And that's why Jerry Cohen, despite being a socialist, never did socialist philosophy writing. He did private philosophy writing. The understand when it comes to art, they even understand it when it comes to private property and personal goods. So the typical socialist today says, you can own your own shirts, you can have a house as long as you don't rent it, you can have your own car as long as you don't drive for Uber, you can have your own guitars as long as you don't make money playing the music. They only get upset when you use these things to then make money in turn or use them productively. Right. They right. say that has to be done collectively. But those very same people, they understand that when it comes to the creation of art, when it comes to the creation of culture, when it comes to the creation of philosophy, collective creation of everything stifles individual creativity and forces everyone to work the same way by majority vote. And that would be awful. So what, what's their complaint? Why is it when they turn to making chairs and pants, they say, well, that has to be done collectively with, it's through some sort of democratic process rather than through individual decision making. I, maybe it's a failure of empathy on their part. Maybe it's because they don't understand why, in the same way that Jerry Cohen wants to write his own philosophy papers, Minnie Mouse wants to experiment with making her bows her way, and real-life entrepreneurs want to test their own vision of how they think they can serve other people. There is this view among socialists that if you um, do something for profit, somehow it's morally inferior or not ethically um, you know, justifiable or as ethically, ethically justifiable as if you do it f uh, like, um, because you want it as a goal in itself. You know, like um, you paint a nice uh, painting and then you're an artist and somehow they don't bother so much if you sell the painting afterwards in that case, but, but they have this feeling that if you're an artist or a philosopher and you write a book, it's not as bad as if you, or if that's okay, but if you are, a uh, chair-making person who wants to sell the church, this is, uh, this is uh, immoral because you are, uh, you are looking for profit. Yeah. Why do you think that socialists have this problem with profit-making? 
is, is that a moral intuition? Why, why, is, why is it that they uh, are so upset by people making profit um, out of, for instance, healthcare or education or things like this? They say no on moral grounds. Even on moral grounds, they say uh, this is unacceptable. We cannot accept profit out of uh, healthcare system. This is. Why do you think they have that? I think most people don't understand what profit is. I think that's true of socialists. Right. Um, when we study, we, there, there have been surveys that have been done testing for what are called anti-profit beliefs among the general population. And what we find is that if you describe a business, an activity to people and you tell them no additional information, you say it's not done for profit, they assume that it's helpful. If you tell them it's done for profit, they assume that it's hurting people. And the more profit they make, the more they assume that it's hurting it. It's just a bias. The information isn't there. I think the reason for that is that most people have a view of human interaction where if you and I trade, one person has to be the winner and one person and has to be sum. the loser. Yeah. Exactly, a zero sum. So, and, and Marx and many other classical economists had this kind of view of trade. Trade is zero sum, there's a winner and a loser. So if I made a profit, that means I'm the winner and that means you're a loser. The more I won, the more you lost. But that's just wrong. The, the most fundamental thing we know about uh, trade is that trade is a positive sum game. You and I will make a trade only if we are both going to profit from that trade. I value, if I buy your scarf from you, you value the money right, right, more than the scarf, and I value the scarf more than the money. We both make a profit. The other thing we know is that in a properly functioning free market, the more profit, the ability to make profit depends in part upon your ability to make these positive sum gains with others. The more profit you're making in general, the more you are correcting a previous market failure, the more you're providing value for others. I can only make a large amount of profit in a competitive market if I'm providing a tremendous amount of service to others. Uh, and so in a market economy, profit's actually a measure of the value you're creating, not a measure of the value that you're taking. To sort of illustrate what it would be to really be genuinely not for profit, I want you to imagine I decide to go to the grocery store and I'm going to have a not for profit grocery store trip. So here's what I do I make a list of all, I have, say, $100 cash on me, and I make a list of all the foods that I value less than that $100, and then I just buy those. That would be not for profit. For profit grocery shopping would be what people really do I go to the grocery store and I buy food that I value more than the money. Right. right? And by the, way, the medical stuff is weird too because you know, doctors are for profit. Nurses are for profit. They're not doing it for free. They're doing it because they value the money they get more than the labor they're putting into it. It's just, and so every single person working in the healthcare system is working for profit, but then if the actual company does it, the overall right. company, then suddenly we get angry. But again, that's just this prejudice we have where we assume that if a company is not for profit, it has to be promoting the common good. If it's for profit, it must not be. So, so there is a wrong view of uh, how the price system works, and it's it's an it's an economic fallacy basically to believe that you have a zero sum game when people are making profit. But they also have a view that's um, about the government and the state basically. That is, if you have public universities, for instance, that are run by the state, then that's okay. And as you are pointing out, professors there, everyone is making a profit out of it, and probably uh, sometimes not in the cleanest way because they organize interest groups to get more money from, from the taxpayers and things like that. Uh, so th there is this view that government somehow is sacrosanct. So, so more government failure requires more government intervention. But the market on the other side, uh, if it fails at some point, it re also requires government intervention because the market is you know, um, so unstable and so corrupt and that government is not. Um, so this, uh, you think this is also part of the tradition of Marx and all these, these, these people that would explain why nowadays leftist uh, intellectuals and others still believe that government is sort of, has to be the answer for everything? Yeah, they, I think what you said is absolutely right. Uh, people sort of have this idea that government's job is to promote the common good. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't succeed, we just need to replace it and get different people in there to do it. And if it hasn't succeeded in promoting the common good, it's probably just because we didn't give it enough power. I mean, that's really weird. If I, if I, you know, if you babysat my children and you did a really bad job, it would be weird for you to say, yeah, I, I was neglectful to them for three hours, but if you gave me them for twelve hours, I would have been even better. I would have been better. Right. We right, would never right, think right. that. But when if a government says that, we're like, oh, okay, that's a convincing argument, which is silly.
The problem that people have here is that they forget that the people who work in governments, the people who work in the nonprofit sector, like me, I work in the nonprofit sector, we're human beings, we're driven as much by self-interest, we have the same flaws that all other human beings have. In fact, I recently wrote an entire book about the role of self-interest in the university system. Mm -hmm. And it actually turns out that universities, despite being run not-for-profit, private versus public, they're not-for-profit entities for the most part, um, the, the people within the system are all pursuing their self-interest at the expense of the public. In fact, most universities, including probably my own, can't really justify the expense that they incur. We consume more resources from society than what we put back. We make the world is worse off with us than without them because we overconsume resources. And we get away with it because since we're not profit, no one looks too closely at what we do. Right. It's, a, it's a fallacy. You have to look at individual behavior. You can't just use profit as a proxy for evil and not for profit as a proxy for good. You mentioned um, yesterday, I think, uh, Michael Sandel's book, What Money Can't Buy. And there he makes the case that there are certain things that are like sacred, that we should live uh, out of the marketplace. And his book was very influential in Chile among certain intellectuals. Uh, they have repeated these ideas on television everywhere. Um, could you briefly um, mention Sandel's main point and, and what would your response be to that? Maybe at some point uh, it would be nice to have a book like this, like what money can buy, you know? Uh, Uh, there is actually someone in Chile who wrote a book like that. But um, what's your view on that take, but that uh, vision? You know? Yeah. Uh, the Canadian philosopher uh, Peter Jaworski and I wrote a book that was largely a response to Sandel. It's called Markets Without Limits. Right. And we have a lot to say. And, and one of them is about the empirics. Sandel repeatedly makes the argument that if people are exposed to markets, if you start commodifying certain things, that will make us worse people. His evidence for this is really bad. It's based primarily upon one study done in the 1970s that has a very ambiguous result. Since that study has been done, lots of much better, more scientific studies have been done, which find the opposite result. In fact, that's the overwhelmingly what the evidence finds, is that commodifying things and introducing money actually makes people behave nicer rather than worse. By the way, this has been pointed out to Sandel many times by a number of different scholars, and every time he goes and gives his talks, For profit, he charges like $25,000 for a talk. He fails to mention that to his audience because they don't know better. So I think right. I'm suspicious that he's just simply deeply intellectually corrupt, and I'm happy to say that on camera. I've said it before. The other thing about Sandel is that uh, he says, well, some things are sacred, and that's why we can't buy them. But what are the things that he's talking about? So a good example would be kidneys. Right. In the United States, 100,000 people are on a wait list for a kidney. In Canada, about 9,000 people. Most of those people will not get a kidney, and most of them will die from kidney-related disease. Why don't they have kidneys? It's because people are not nice enough to give them away for free. I've asked about 5,000 people in talks, have you ever given away a kidney away from a stranger? And even when I'm in really left-wing places where people supposedly have bleeding hearts, they never open up their bodies and give away a kidney for free. Right. So, But would they? Would they be willing to? And so I'll ask them, if it were legal, would you sell your kidney for $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 US dollars? Pretty much everyone says yes by $100,000. So there is a supply curve for kidneys. There's also demand for kidneys. If my children needed a kidney, I'd sell my guitars, I'd sell my car, I'd, I'd empty out my stocks and so on in order to get a kidney for them if that's what it took to keep them alive. So there's a demand curve for kidneys too. But the market price of kidneys is zero which means that there's a massive shortage in the amount of kidneys that people need. People are not willing to supply them at the level that they need. When we say the human body is too sacred to sell, so therefore we're not going to allow people to sell kidneys, the effect of that is to kill 100,000 people. That's what we're doing. We're condemning those people to die. And I want you to imagine, like, if, if you're Michael Sandel, going up to some like, little girl who needs a kidney because she has kidney failure, and she goes, you know, your mom and dad, they're willing to buy a kidney for you to save your life, And there are thousands of people over there that are willing to sell you a kidney, but you should be gratified and happy to know that you won't get that kidney because the human body is sacred. So hope there's an afterlife because you're going to die. <laughs> it's like I don't understand what conception of morality you could have where you think that that is a compelling argument, but it certainly isn't an art, a theory where you really think of human life as sacred. I think ultimately what Michael Sandel is doing is saying your untutored prejudices against the market, you should roll with those. I'm from Harvard. But there are things, uh, in your view, that should not be um, for sale in the market? 
are there some things that shouldn't be for sale? Yeah, there are things you shouldn't sell because you shouldn't have them. So it's not that like you shouldn't be able to purchase assassination services to have right, them killed. Right, of course. But it's because you shouldn't do it for free. Right. You shouldn't have child pornography because you shouldn't have it for free. You shouldn't have slaves for free. So there are things that you can't buy and sell because you simply shouldn't have them. In that case, it's not the market that's the, I mean, putting on the market might lead to more of the bad thing, but it's not introducing evil where there wasn't already to begin with. If I gave you a gift of 20 slaves, it would be evil, just as if you bought the slaves. Um, so those are things you shouldn't buy and sell. And there are contingent cases where like making the sale a certain way might be the wrong time to do it. If, if my kids are dying and I need to take them to the hospital, now's not the time to like worry about selling a guitar. If I make a promise to you, if I say, I promise I will never sell this shirt, well, then I shouldn't sell it because I promise not to. But other than weird cases like that, our theory is that if something can be given away or exchanged for free, if you're allowed to possess it for free, then there's always some way to create a market where the market will not be morally criticizable and there's a way to sell it for money as well. So we, we should have a marketplace for organs, basically. So people could sell their organs if they wanted to and people could buy them. Um, um, I assume your position on, on drugs is the same. Like, um, it seems to me that one of the gravest mistakes that the West has made is this war against drugs. Not only the West, but you know, the US and, and other countries, the war against drugs doesn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your view on, on drugs in the marketplace and would you put some limits or would you have you know, the supermarket selling cocaine on the shelves, you know, like I think Jeffrey Myron yeah. says you should be able to buy everything all the time in any place. What's your view on that? Because this is an issue now in Chile. Yeah, sense. yeah. I mean, as far as that one book goes, we say, again, there's a question, should you be allowed to have cocaine in the first place? My view is if you can, if you think people can have it for free, then it should be on a market. But even if you think they shouldn't, Let's, let's say no one should possess cocaine. Let's just say it's bad. It doesn't follow from that that criminalizing it is a good idea because we have lots of evidence now that when you criminalize these drugs, you actually make them worse and more dangerous. So I'm going to reveal something to people that they might not know, but I am a drug user and I go to a drug dealer pretty frequently, um, but my drug dealer's name is Starbucks. Right? And when I go to Starbucks, they serve the drug in a really high quality form, the drug's caffeine, and they have really cheery people providing it for me, and it's a very clean environment, and they go out of their way to make sure that the drug is of a consistently high quality. And they know that if the drug hurts me, that I'm gonna be able to recover damages against them. So they ensure that the drug that they provide is going to be safe. That's what happens when things are for sale on markets in a legal environment. When you criminalize it, some people stop using it, but that doesn't mean it goes away. The funny thing about criminalizing something that people want, like drugs or sex or other kinds of maybe sinful behaviors, but they, people want them, people still consume those things, but they consume them on a black market. And in fact, because they're criminalized, you actually create opportunities for extra normal levels of profit. And so as Milton Friedman once said, the, the purpose of the US drug war is to enrich the cartels. From an economist's point of view, that's what it does. You create extra normal profit opportunities for the least scrupulous people in society to provide that good. And it's provided at poor quality. If you buy heroin, it's not like buying it at Starbucks. It's not buying, like buying coffee at Starbucks. They give you low quality stuff. You don't know how good it is. If it's bad quality, you can do nothing to recover against them. If you're harmed by it, you can't sue them. So you actually make it more dangerous. And you arguably even make it more addictive. So we found from the decriminalization of uh, marijuana in Colorado from the significant decriminalization of drugs in, um, in Portugal and elsewhere, that when drugs are decriminalized, people actually use fewer of them. And one reason for that might be because of the effect of how, how drugs are delivered when it's criminalized. So say in the United States, um, there's a common phenomenon. So consumption has fallen? Yeah, consumption has Colorado. gone down. Really? And it might be because uh, when things are decriminalized, the less addictive versions of it are what gets sold. That might sound weird, but you can illustrate this with thinking about a perversity of the uh, American system. In the United States, when you turn 18, you can own a gun, you can run, you can uh, go fight in a war, but you can't have a beer. Nevertheless, people yeah. drink. So at universities like where I work, the rule is if you're under 21, you're not allowed to have alcohol in your dorm room. Nevertheless, students do. But when they ha consume alcohol, 
because it's illegal for them to have it, they try to hide it. And that means that they try to have the most potent form of the alcohol they can in a concentrated form. They'll buy things like Bacardi 151, which is an incredibly strong form of rum, or Everclear, which is almost pure alcohol. They don't buy beer because a case of beer is this big and is hard to hide from your people monitoring you in your dorm room. A little bottle of really strong alcohol is easy to hide. Something similar like that happens with other kinds of drugs. When it's illegal, you know, people might prefer to chew coca leaves that have like a bit of a stimulant to snorting cocaine to um, smoking crack. But when it's illegal, you as a drug dealer have an incentive to, to keep the most potent, easy, concentrated form of it um, because it's easiest to hide, easiest to throw out. If you're walking around with coca leaves, obviously the cops are going to find you. So then you get the more potent and the more dangerous versions and that's what people consume. So one of the effects of criminalizing drugs is to make drugs ever more intense and strong. You don't see that with, uh, as much with not-for-profit drugs. I mean, people do sometimes drink spirits and hard liquor, but they mostly drink wine and beer and other weaker things. Some people like to buy coffee that has an incredibly high concentration of caffeine, but most people just drink regular coffee that doesn't. Um, it's only with the hard drugs that are criminalized you see the consumption of really, really strong addictive forms. And that might explain why when you decriminalize drugs, the overall amount of drug use goes down and not up. Will you have some sort of regulation if you decriminalized it? I would say there's a good question for economists about what the optimal level of government regulation is for any kind of good. Um, and so I might have my own personal opinions on that. but. I would say you should treat these as whatever your, your view, you the listener, your view is on how you should regulate automobiles or regulate shirts. You should treat, treat it as a drug kind of like that. So there's a question about do you want to let children buy these things? Should you be of a certain age to buy it? And you can, you can debate that kind of question. Um, though you have to, when you do debate that question, you have to keep in mind saying that 16-year-olds are not allowed to buy cocaine is not the same thing as saying 16-year-olds won't consume cocaine. It's rather the choice between will 16-year-olds be able to go to a store and buy it or will they have to have their friends buy it for them and get it that way. But it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter because around the world, people have easy access to hard drugs. You know, so yeah, I often yeah, survey, yeah. People, I'll, I'll survey people in my class and I say to them, you know, I, I work at a fairly posh, upper-class university with these sort of elite students from all around the world. And I'll ask them, how many of you, if I... If, think it would be easy for you to get the following drugs within 24 hours and just go down a list. Methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, whatever it might be. I list all these drugs and all of them say, yeah, I know someone who could get me that tomorrow, even though these things are illegal. Right. So right. It, it, in a sense, it doesn't work. It doesn't, what regulation should you have? It's a good question, but you have to keep in mind it, it doesn't really matter because if people want it, they're going to get it anyways. The question you have to ask is, since this is going to be sold, do I want it to be sold the way Starbucks sell things, or do you want it to be sold the way the guys on the street sell it? I'd, I'd go with Starbucks. Finally, um, how should we face the campaign against capitalism to delegitimize capitalism, you know, on moral grounds? Um, what would your advice be for young people, for students who are going to watch this uh, conversation and um, in general for public intellectuals and, and so on. How should we um, face the challenge of increasing activism and critique against capitalism, not only from the left but also from the right? Uh, you have certain movements that you know, are very skeptical about the free market and free trade, of course. Um, how could we engage in this battle of ideas and um, and do a better job, you know, in order to convince more people that the right way to go is um, is this one and not uh, Cohen's one or Alexandria ocasio cortez way or Jeremy Corbyn or whatever, yeah. or Donald Trump even. Um, first of all, I think you have to have the serenity to recognize the things you can't change. And as a person who's written quite a few books and articles on voter behavior, I can say, you really can't change most people's minds because when they're saying these things, they're not even in the process of really advocating policy. So we have to admit that up front. The second thing is it's true that there's a tremendous amount of economic ignorance. Um, right. econo economics as a discipline, even though there's disagreement about things, has a wide range of agreement on certain facts about how the economy works, about how markets work. And when we survey the average person who ha doesn't have a training in economics, their opinions about how the economy works are completely different from what the experts say. They just don't understand it. And to some degree, maybe we can fix that by 
going through and helping people understand how markets work better and explaining, you know, when people are prejudiced against profit, you could use my shopping example and say, well, what are you talking about when you make a profit? What is that? Mm -hmm. But maybe more importantly than um, making these economic arguments is making the moral arguments as well. Because even when you show people that markets work and non-market activity does not succeed the way that they think it does, or in some cases entirely fails, um, they still have this latent sense that markets are kind of icky and that other forms of cooperation have the moral high ground. And a mistake that many classical liberal thinkers think is to reject the moral values of their interlocutors. So socialists say, we care about equality in the poor, and libertarians sometimes say, that stuff doesn't matter. All that matters is that we, we don't aggress against one another. Right. When you say that to the average person, they go, yeah, I thought libertarians were jerks, and he just confirmed it. Right. You right know? So you need right. to be able to say to them, yeah, I also care about poverty and I care about equality. And that's one of the reasons why I reject socialism because as a matter of fact, the poor do the best in capitalist societies. Right. The poor in capitalist societies are richer than the middle class in non-capitalist societies. You know, what we call poverty in say the United States mm -hmm. is on par with the average world income. And that's adjusting for the cost of living. So. Sure, you know, there's inequality, but, but also, hey, by the way, in the social societies, it turns out there's actually more inequality, right. not less. So you can say, I share your values, and that's part of the reason why I'm on this side and not that side. I think your values are the right values, but I think the things, the policies that you think realize your values in the real world don't. Inequality is a concept. I mean, um, Harry Frankfurt has this um, brief book about inequality. It's called on inequality, I guess, um, if I remember correctly. And he says, um, inequality is not the issue per se. We, would, we should uh, worry that everyone has enough. And uh, he proposes this uh, sufficient minimum, you know. Yeah. Um, how do you see that, that uh, proposal? I mean, I like the book so much that if you turn the book over, there's a blurb from me praising it. Uh, so, oh, I have yeah. the, I have the, yeah. Uh, was, um, uh, yeah. I think, I think Harry, what I like about what Frankfurt says is he says to most egalitarians, you're missing the point. Right, what, exactly. The point is to make everyone equal. I mean, if, if we were all equally poor, that would be horrible. The point is, when you're thinking about institutions and you're thinking about the background rules that we're going to live under, um, to justify those rules to everybody, you have to be able to say, your life goes well under these rules compared to the al certain alternatives. And that means thinking about poverty. And I've noticed when I talk to students, especially students on the left, they often slip very quickly from talking about poverty to talking about right. inequality. Right. But let's be clear, nobody dies from inequality. People right. die from poverty. Right? If you look at, say, what's happening in the parts of the world where there's still famine, it's not like, oh, the problem is they're unequal. The problem is they don't have food. They that's, need food. That's why they migrate to other yes. places. Yes. Okay. In the places where people are diseased, the problem isn't that, like, well, you don't have disease and they do. The problem is that they have disease. You don't fix the problem of uh, the problems of poverty simply by equalizing things. You right. fix them by creating more. And actually, if you really want to eliminate poverty, we need more. That's, right. and that's the thing that right. people right. miss. Right. Growth is imperative if, from a left wing point of view. If I were to um, try to find a thing I'll use as a magic wand, if I were to wave this magic wand and equalize all world incomes, and imagine I could do that without um, lowering the total amount of stuff produced at all, which is, which is not plausible. In fact, it would. But imagine I could just simply equalize all world incomes right now. What this would do is put everyone in the world at what the US considers the poverty line. It would put everyone, it would mean everyone in the world just barely makes it. Mm -hmm. There's not enough stuff right, right, right now. Right. We, so if you want to eliminate poverty, you need a continued growth. And for what it's worth, the world is on that course. So um, if, if we have just a modest growth rate worldwide of about 1% over the next 100 years, then by the year 2100, the average person alive in the world will be as rich as the typical person in Canada or Germany today. So we're on track to escape the situation of poverty. Right now, only about 9% of people live in extreme poverty, whereas in 1960, it was two-thirds of people, and in 1900, it was 95% of people. So poverty is disappearing before our eyes, and people are being lifted up, but it requires continued growth. Right. Equalizing things is not sufficient because there isn't sufficient stuff right now to eliminate poverty. Thank you very much, Jason. It has been uh, really interesting. And uh, I hope uh, we can have you soon again here in Chile. And uh, I wish you a safe flight in case I, I don't see you again uh, today. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Same Thank here. you. Appreciate it.